everything. So it's just been a great uh, season already. So many people, you know, so faithful in their work. And uh, I just think about, you know, our, our worship team. I think about, you know, Saturday services, our kids last week. I mean, a lot going on. You guys with your angel tree, y'all have been so faithful in that. And so let me just say thank you uh, from our side. There's many families uh, that have been blessed by your generosity and your faithfulness. And each year, it increases, and that's such an awesome thing. And so thank you uh, for uh, your willingness to be used uh, by the Lord. So I always ask the weekend before Christmas, how many of you, you are finished, you are done, no sweat, you can cruise to Christmas. Raise your hand. How many of you? All my A-type personalities. So Such overachievers, you guys. And that's why y'all come to the 8 o'clock service, by the way. <laughs> that will be the most hands of any service that I asked. The 1115, there will be no hands that go up at all because they all slept in anyway and they're coming. To, I'm just kidding. I can talk trash about them because they're not here yet. But 1115, they won't have any hands going up. Okay, so you've got a couple of times. Now, how many of you, you got time? You got till Tuesday. And so you still got work to do, but no stress. Raise your hand. How many of you are straight up freaking out right now? And you're like, please finish the sermon early because I got a lot of work to get done. We are praying for you. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Luke. I want to say, many of you know uh, Corey, who works in our office, Corey and Brian LaRussa. Uh, she gave birth this past Friday to twins, and so we want to say congratulations to them. Mike, uh, Brian's father, sent me a, a text Friday and said, everybody's healthy, uh, no names yet, and we haven't ruled out Denise and DeNephew, and so I'm very <laughs> excited that I could influence them in that way. Take your Bibles, go with me to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 2. We're finishing our series this morning, uh, His Story, and really we began this uh, really almost really back in Habakkuk, if you really want to think about it, as we walk through just the timeline of the story of the Gospel, right? I mean, uh, part of me coming into this season, I know, and I've shared this over these last couple of weeks, um, is, you know, to Lord, allow me to, to come at even the story of Christmas in a fresh way. I think for many of us who are raised in the church, many of us who's very familiar with this story, in some ways it can work against us. And what I mean by that is the sense that, you know, we've heard it, right? Uh, born of a virgin, we've heard it. Like, born in a manger, like, we've heard it. Emmanuel, God with us. And if we're not careful, it can kind of wash over us a little bit. And if we're not careful, we can kind of fall into this trap a little bit of, of seeing it as the world sees it. You know, very commercialized, like making it about everything other than what we read about. It's really about here in Scripture. And so my prayer through this whole season is, again, as we talk about living every day, what? Captivated and changed by Jesus. Man, if there's a place that we should be captivated, it's at the story of Christmas. That God would come to us, right? And this is what I want us to see. As, we, as we've been walking through this series, two weeks ago, we kind of took the eternal view, right? To not fall into the trap that as we celebrate Christmas, we're not just celebrating the birth or the beginning of Jesus. Yes, the physical beginning of Jesus, but not the beginning of Jesus, right? John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, as we looked two weeks ago, he says, in the beginning was the word, right? Capital W, a title that is unique to John in his description of Jesus, Logos. He is the communication of of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just a prophet. This is not just a king. This is not just a priest. This is God taking on human form. Last week, we looked at the passage of Isaiah, 700 years. Again, allow that to sink in. It'd be like someone in the year 1319 making a prophecy and us seeing it today, every detail of what was spoken over 700 years ago. And so as we looked at that very famous passage of Isaiah 7, 14, there's the prophet in the midst of darkness proclaiming hope of the coming Messiah. And we know that it didn't just begin there in Isaiah, right? That that was something that was prophesied all the way back in the Garden of Eden, that we cannot separate the story of Christmas from the story of our sins. That the story of Christmas is because of the story of our sin. And you go to Genesis 3, it's the fall of man. And there in the garden, as God confronts Adam and Eve, where they really deserve judgment in that moment, we see a God of mercy who proclaims there in that place, there will come one who, yes, his heel will be bruised, but he will crush, he will be victorious, he will succeed over the head of the enemy. And so as we work through this story, now this morning, we come to the birth narrative. And I had originally anticipated to go to Matthew, to be honest with you, but I just love Luke so much. Dr. Luke, he's a physician, and some of the details that he uses, and even some of the titles uh, that he uses, we're going to look at this morning. Very famous passage, verse 11, so Luke chapter 2, verse 11, but we're going to be looking at pretty much all 14 verses uh, in the narrative passage of Luke chapter 2. Top of the message this morning, a promise fulfilled, as we've been building up now to the fulfillment of the promise declared 
in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to invite you to stand with me in reverence to reading God's Word. The Gospel of Luke. As we know, he is writing as a physician in many ways as we've looked through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to pick this back up in the new year, not right away, but probably around February, we're going to get back into the Gospel of Luke. We know that in many ways he's kind of writing as an investigative reporter, right? Luke writes in a way where he builds his case, where a lot of times he will make a statement and then he'll, okay, he'll say, okay, here's the evidence now to back up the statement that has been made. And so even as you look at the, 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 the details that he gives here in chapter 2, Again, he wants to make sure that we understand that this one that we're reading about is not just another birth, that this one that we're reading about is not just a prophet, that the one that we're reading about is not just a king, right? That the one that we're reading about is the one that we read about in Isaiah, in Habakkuk. He's the one that we read about in Genesis 3. And so Luke wants us to understand that this Christ is unique. He is the one and only, and he is the promise fulfilled from the Father. The Bible says this. Let's just read verse 11. And then we'll work through a lot of the passages this morning. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Very familiar passage. I'm sure you've seen it on many of your Christmas cards or some that have been sent to you. It says this, For there is born to you this day in the city of David. Say it with me, A. It's the whole point of Christmas right there. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now notice that phrase, Christ the Lord. Christos Curios. It's very important the title that Luke gives him. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, here this final Sunday before we celebrate Christmas. We thank you that we can gather with our church family, with our families, Lord, for the purpose of lifting high the name that is so deserving of our praise and glory, the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that even as we walk through today and tomorrow and, and Tuesday and Wednesday, Lord, that you would allow us to keep our eyes upon you, recognizing there's a lot of different things that's going to be taking place over these next couple of days, but Lord, may we not miss what this is all about, how personal this story is, that it's not just a story of Christmas and the time of year, this is a personal story to us, that you came for us, that what we could not do of ourselves, which is save ourselves, Lord, you did for us. So, Lord, this morning, may we be captivated in a way like we're approaching the story for the very first time, that God would become a man, still fully God, beyond what we can understand, that he might die in our place. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. We thank you for Christmas because it's Christmas that leads to Easter, and it's Easter that provides the hope of eternal life. We give you praise for what you have done, for what you're doing, and I pray, Lord, Whatever someone walked in with today, let Lord, you would minister to them in a way that is unique to them. Your grace is sufficient. We believe it, we pray it, and we ask it. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I was telling the group last night, uh, the, the shopping thing, like I still got so much work to do. Like I'm going to be shopping Christmas Eve, so I'm going to, like the five o'clock service, I'm going to keep that real short. Because what time does Walmart close? I think I still got an hour or two after that service. But like, you know, I used to tell my mom, she'd be like, you know, you got a paper coming up or you got you need to study for this test. And I'd say, mom, I work best under pressure. That's like, that's what I would always say. Basically, I would say I'm a procrastinator and I will do it the night before, but for you, I'm just gonna tell you I work best under pressure. And so I would try to use that line. My senior year, we were playing in a tournament, and I went to the free throw line, I was fouled with no time on the clock. Like, it's a dream come true. As a little kid, you're, 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 you're practicing in your driveway, and you're dreaming that you get fouled, and the game is tied, and you go to the free throw line, and you win the game. That's what happens in your dreams. That's not always what happens in real life. I was fouled, the game was, uh, the clock had ended. We were down one, it wasn't tied, we were down one. I go for the first free throw, and it's a brick. I mean, I could have built our new building out there, right? I mean, I laid a huge brick. Second free throw barely touched the rim, okay? And so the next week, I had a test. And my mom's like, Heath, you need to study for this test? I'm like, Mom, I work best under pressure. She said, Heath, you know why I know that's not true? She said, number one, I've seen your grades. Number two, I watched you choke at the free throw line last week. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. She's such an encouragement. She's such a Barnabas in my life, and so I'm very thankful for her honesty. I remember in seminary, professors would say, surround yourself with people who tell you the truth. And I'm like, what about the people who tell you more truth than you really want to know, right? Some people where you're like, hey, hold off for that truth for tomorrow, right? You've given me a lot of truth today. Let me deal with that. I'll deal with it tomorrow. Praise God for my second and third and fourth Holy Spirit, my wife, my mom, and now my son. All right, Luke chapter 2. Here we go. 
I love what one pastor said. I thought it was so good. He said on that first Christmas morning, he who had always been God, think about this, became a man. He who had always been God became something he had never been for all of eternity. The eternal son took on human flesh to become an earthly son. Again, just think about that. We've heard the story, and many times it hits us like, yeah, I know this story, but just allow this. The eternal God became something he had never been. No beginning, no end. The eternal son took on human flesh to become an earthly son. And so the question is why, right? I mean, the Christmas story, right? It can't just be about holiday cheer, and it can't just be about traditions, and it can't just be about gathering with our families, right? We understand that the story of Christmas is personal, that the story of Christmas is personal to you and it's personal to me, and it's connected directly to our sins. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you believe it, say amen, amen. And the consequences of that, right? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is, that puts us in an awful predicament. Because there's nothing we can do to bridge that gap, right? Our attempt to get to God, you know what that's called? It's called religion. We can't do it. God's step towards us is called what? The gospel. And he's already done it. And so as we talk about the story, right, I want you to, again, see a God who came for us. And I pray that you're encouraged this morning. I pray if you're struggling in this Christmas season, I know that there are many I know there are many who are hurting, especially as they move into this time of year. Maybe this is their first Christmas for many without a loved one. And it can be a hard time, right? And so I pray that the presence of God in your life, your relationship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, right, that you will see the personal aspect of Christmas, that yes, it is personal to you because he came for you, he came for me. That it's not just this broad, wide stroke Christmas, Jesus came. No, he came for me. And when I stand before the Father, I know that I stand covered by the blood of Jesus. And it all comes back for me personally to Christmas. Because it had it not been for this, we would all be standing before God guilty, still in our sins. Luke gives us this picture of who this baby is. And I want you to see verse 11. We're going to work through a couple of different verses this morning. A promise fulfilled. It says this, for is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior. Notice what he says here. Who is Christ the Lord, Greek name Christos. It basically speaks of the Messiah. The literal translation is the anointed one. And so what Luke says, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, the anointed one of God, and who is the Lord. That's basically what he's saying there in that phrase. And again, he is identifying the fact that we need to understand that this is the one, the one and only, not one of many, just as Jesus said in John 14, 6, right, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not one of many, but one way, because there is one person, Jesus, one God who came in human form who died on the cross for our sins. And so what you could say is this, the Bible declares many came before him as prophet, many came before him as priest, many came before him as king, but Jesus was the once and for all prophet, priest, and king. And in his name, it declares that. The name Christ declares this is the one. Every sacrifice that was made in the sacrificial system, this is the one that it pointed to. This is the one that it illustrated. Every lamb that was slain, every blood that was shed was pointing to God's lamb, was pointing to the spotless lamb. And so here is Luke saying, Christos, right, the anointed of God. Here is the one that was all leading to. Anointed for what? Well, he explains that. Look at what he says in verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David. Say it with me, a what? Savior. Now, it's interesting here. It literally means, again, anointed to save. In the ancient world, a savior was seen as a deliverer from disease or danger or really any other human predicament. It wasn't spoken in a spiritual way. It wasn't spoken in sin. It was spoken in, I'm in danger and I've now been delivered. It was often used to refer to the Greek gods. So to proclaim this, for Luke to proclaim this, to proclaim Jesus as the savior, notice what he says when he combines the two phrases now. The anointed of God to save, the anointed of God to save, the anointed of the Father for the purpose of saving, that the purpose of this birth is not just vague or random, that the purpose of this birth is that this baby came to die. He came to save. He is the anointed one of God sent here to 
save. And that's what Jesus says, right? You go to Luke 19, verse 10. He says what? For the Son of Man has come, and he says to seek and to save that which was lost. We see that just in his name. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. And it wasn't just a random thing that he was given that name. Jump down, if you would, to verse 21. Look at Luke 2, verse 21. Everything was in line. Everything was lined up by God. Now, I want you to see this in his sovereignty, and I pray that you're encouraged, maybe in the chaos of your own life. In the world at this time, it was chaos. It was dark. But in the darkest of times, God was doing his greatest work. I pray you're encouraged by that this morning. Sometimes we don't see, right, the hands of God. What, what, what must we do? We must trust the what? The heart of God. The heart of God never wavered. From the moment it was declared in the garden, the heart of God never waited. Yes, there was a lot of time to wait, but his timing was perfect. And as Paul declares in the fullness of time, what is he saying? In the exact right moment, not a second before, not a second later, he came. And look at what it says there in verse 21, just in his name. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel. Before he was conceived in the womb, Luke says this baby is the anointed one of God, the anointed one of God sent to save. His name is Jesus, Jehovah saves. This next phrase, though, is critical. And it goes to John 1.1 1, 1 in a lot of ways, confirming the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the last part of verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, the anointed of God, who is Christ the Lord. Now, just as we know the word is a title that is unique to John, this phrase right here is unique to Luke. This is unique to Luke, where he describes Jesus as Christ the Lord, Christ the Lord, the anointed Lord. So not just the anointed of God to save, but the anointed Lord. Now, what's interesting about here is the word Lord is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. As many of you know, the most sacred, the most reverent name used of God in the Old Testament, there were seven names that were so reverent that, that there were strict instructions of even how you wrote those names down. There were strict instructions of how you even approached it. Many wouldn't even pronounce it because they were scared they would mispronounce it, and there could be judgment just in the pronouncement of the name. And so to see what Luke is declaring here, he is saying, listen, Yahweh, the one that we worship, the one that we know has, 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 has full authority over this earth. Christ the Lord, Christ the Yahweh, Christ the full and mighty God. Again, to hear this phrase 2,000 years ago, this would have stopped you in your tracks. Okay, anointed by God, I, I can deal with that, right? Elisha was anointed by God. Isaiah was anointed by God. Jeremiah was anointed. Maybe this baby is anointed by God to be a prophet. Okay, anointed by God for what? To save Okay, well, maybe he's saving his people from political oppression or, or social oppression, right? Save can take on many different forms. But when he pins this down, this puts this baby in a category that cannot be said of any other birth. There is born to this day in the city of David a Savior who is God, is what he's saying, who is Christ the Lord. And understand, when he applied this phrase, a savior, Christ the Lord, he is saying that this baby equal with God, exercising all power as God. And it's so interesting here, just these three titles, right? I heard it said this past week. I've never thought of it this way. It said you could say that Jesus is his human name, right? What does it mean? Jehovah saves. Christ is his holy name. What does it mean? The anointed one of God. Lord is his heavenly name, which is the Old Testament equivalent Hebrew to Yahweh. It speaks of his divine nature. This was not just a good teacher, a good prophet, a good king. This was God born in Bethlehem. Again, hard for our minds to comprehend. I think the Trinity is probably one of the things that, that, that most is, is hard for me to wrap my mind around. I believe it and I trust it and I preach it. But to see how it all plays out here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But understand, this is why Christmas is good news, right? We call the gospel good news, right? It's good news because he came for us. Can I get an amen? It's good news, right? Christmas is not good news because of holiday cheer. Because I'm going to be real with you, there's not a lot of holiday cheer out there right now. This past week I was out there, and people are just straight up miserable. Can I get an amen? Oh, don't, don't amen that. Don't amen that. <laughs> people are mean this time of year. Like, they're stressed out, and I get that. Like, you're stressed out, you got to get this done, and you got to get that done. And listen, as believers, we can fall in. I fell into that trap this past week. 
I was getting frustrated driving. I was getting frustrated parking. I was getting frustrated at the people in line. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm missing all of this. I'm missing what this is about. Right? I want to give gifts to my, my family and give gifts to my, my son and give gifts to my wife. I want to do those things, but may they be a symbolic of the gift that God has given me. May I not miss the personal aspect of Christmas. That he came for me. Listen, if you struggle with your value, your worth, your identity, hear this at Christmas, he came for you. And if you had been the only one, he would have still come. He came for you. The God who spoke this universe into existence entered into his own existence, into his own creation. It's mind-boggling to me to come as a baby. I mean, this is such good news, right? I mean, that there's rejoicing. I mean, look at, look at what's happening here. Look at verse 8. How could there not be? This is the promise fulfilled from the garden. Verse 8 of chapter 2. Now we're in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, remember that word means stop, pay attention, listen to what's happening. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. How could they not be? Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, what, of great Joy, great news, good news to all people. And because of who this baby was, there was praise. Look at verse 13, 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. A promise established in the Garden of Eden, there in Genesis 3.15, a promise that went unfulfilled for thousands of years. Are you waiting on a promise this morning? I promise you ain't going to have to wait a 1,000 years because we'll be in heaven by then. Get what I'm saying? But for thousands of years, God's people waited upon this promise. God wasn't late. He was perfect. Hear me. God wasn't late. He was perfect. Now, his ways are not our ways, right? His timing is not our timing. Listen, I know that there are some of you here today struggling with that, but in the Christmas story, may you be encouraged by the providence of God, by the sovereignty of God. Hey, by the timing of God. Are you waiting on some promises in your life? Listen, there were promises here that God's people were waiting upon, and as Paul described, in the fullness of time, at just the right time, not a second earlier, not a second later, at just the right time, God intervened. We serve a God that we can trust in his faithfulness. That although this was a promise that had gone unfulfilled for thousands of years, hear what I'm saying, a promise from God is a promise forever. And so the practical application is this. There are some of you this Christmas season that need to grab a hold of a promise and just absolutely stay there. God, I don't know when this is going to happen, but I trust in you. And I trust in your word. Look at this. Go back to verse 1. You just see again the Lord, the sovereignty of God, like 25,000 steps ahead. And using, even again, decisions by sinful people. I want you to see this. Go back to verse 1. Let's just walk through a story that we've read many times. It says this. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Again, understanding that there had been silence, right? That after the ministries of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, over 400 years, that God's people had not heard a word from the Lord. Now, according to history, the Lord was organizing things for the arrival of the Savior. Just to kind of understand what's happening here. It was chaotic. It was dark times, right? For the next 300 years after Malachi, Haggai, and Zechariah, uh, Persia ruled the world, modern-day Iran. Around 336 B.C., Persia was overthrown by Alexander the Great. I'm giving you a little bit of history lesson, not because I know it by heart, but because I Googled it. In 2000 B.C., Rome took over the world states. And we know that there, 200 years before Jesus was born, Rome is in authority. This is the world in which Jesus was born into. No coincidence. One of the trademarks of the Roman rule was their system of taxation. They were known for this. If you look at verse 3, it says this. So all went to what? Be registered, everyone to their own city. Registered, why? Because there is a census that is being taken. Why is there a census being taken? For the purpose of taxation. What the enemy intends for evil, God uses for good. If you believe that, say amen. Amen? What the enemy intends for evil, God uses for good. So even in the prideful hearts of rulers and kingdoms and setting up systems to oppress people and even make the wealthier wealthier, God used. 
He used in his sovereignty all the moving parts to bring the Savior into the world. And listen, every single thing was under his authority, even the point of them going to Bethlehem. I mean, they were registering, right? Unlike today, rather than registering in the place where you live, you go to where you were born. That's what's happening. Verse 3, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Notice the next part, verse 4 and 5. Again, here we go. Prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled. Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. We know prophecy of the Messiah to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife who was with child. And so understand this, right? This trip may not have been, and I believe it wasn't, anticipated by Mary and Joseph. However, this trip had already been arranged, appointed, and assigned by God. Are you dealing with some things in your life that you did not anticipate? I think we've all been in those places. However, take courage, just like Mary and Joseph. They didn't anticipate what was getting ready to happen, but it had been prearranged that this is the way it was going to play out, right? We know 400 years earlier, the prophet Micah declared these words in chapter 5, verse 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, which is the ancient name from Judah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one, the one, the one and only to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, from everlasting. But from a human perspective, right, I mean, put this into play. I mean, Joseph, right, I just, I love Joseph. And I think he's kind of, in many ways, the unsung hero of Christmas. He could have blown up the whole thing, right? I mean, at any moment, when the angel came to him and said, hey, Joseph, he didn't cheat on you, right? I know that you may think that this is a hit against Charles' relationship, and it's going to be embarrassing to what the public sees and what they think. But understand, this is the work of God. I mean, let's give the God credit, right? That, that, that required a lot of faith. It shows his walk in the Lord. That he would put her behind, not, not, not publicly shame her, not put her out there, but trust in something that is hard for any of us to believe. Hey, I'm pregnant, but I'm pregnant by God. Imagine that guys out here, okay, you're getting ready to get married, your girl comes to you, hey, I'm pregnant, but it, I didn't cheat on you. The Holy Spirit touched my womb, and I'm carrying the child of God. Okay, girl, I know what really happened. I'm going my way, you go your way, right? Joseph didn't do that. He trusted the Lord. And yet he's the guy in the play that never gets any parts. And I always struggle with that, right? Like, I always wanted to be Joseph in the living the TV just simply because he sat down and he got to sit beside the cute girl who was married. But ultimately, he never gets any parts. But he's such a key role in the story of Christmas. Here is this man of God who at any point could have said, you know what? No, I don't believe any of that. But he didn't. And here he is now, his wife getting ready to give birth. Now, understand something. We're not talking about months away. We're talking about days away from giving birth. And you see that even in the way that Luke describes this. Look at verse 5. Here's a physician writing these words, Dr. Luke. He went to be registered with Mary, who is betrothed wife. Now, notice what he says there. Who was with child? It speaks of the swelling inside. He is speaking of the term of her pregnancy. The literal translation would be this. In other words, Mary was great with child, is what he says. My translation, she's about to pop, all right? This girl is about to give birth, all right? And now all of a sudden, Joseph's got the bags packed. We're ready to go to the first general hospital of Nazareth. But no, God says, no, you got to get up and you got to put your pregnant wife on a donkey and you are traveling to Bethlehem. No wonder God chose this man to be the adopted earthly father of the Messiah. What fate this requires. Look at verse 6 and 7, prophecy after prophecy. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Listen, if our mission is to live every day captivated and changed by Jesus, just start with the Christmas story. Allow this to sink in, right? The one who created Mary, now in her womb, being formed as a child. The one who created Bethlehem, I mean, let's go a little bit bigger, by the power of his voice, right? That's what the Bible says, our creator God, the Lord Jesus Christ, now traveling to the city he created to be born as a baby? Again, allow this to sink in like you've never heard of. The one who created the sheep from whose wool came the swaddling clothes, he created that sheep. The one who created the trees in which was, was used to build the manger that he's laid, he created that tree. 
And yet he did it. Out of love. Out of love for you. Out of love for me. What we have to understand with this story and all of its details is these circumstances were not coincidental. They were providential. Every single thing. Yes, the free will of man, but the sovereignty of God. God working behind the scenes 2,500 steps ahead of what was happening, him moving things around to make sure that this promise would be fulfilled at just the right time. Verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them for the end. Notice something here. Go down to verse 12 and notice what the angel says to the shepherds. The, she- the angel says specifically to the shepherds, go find this baby. Now, I'm sure the shepherds, okay, well, there's many babies. I'm sure there's many births. How do we know which baby? They say, we'll give you a sign. What's the sign? Look at what it says. Verse 12, and there will be a sign to you. You will find the babe, what? Two things, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, the word sign means monument. It literally means a supernatural marker or miracle. The angel is saying, go and you will find a marker by God that cannot be denied, and it will be a sign. Now, notice the two signs. The first one, wrapped And swaddling clothes. I've never seen this before. The word that's used here, swaddling, right? We think of it, we sing about it, away in a manger. This word, pretty much every time it's used in the Bible, apart from right here, is describing what happens to a body after it dies. It's the wrapping, the cloth, around someone who has passed away. Is that a coincidence? Here is this baby born in a manger, right, wrapped in swaddling clothes, right? There's a picture there. This baby was born to what? Die, right? I mean, that's the purpose that he came, right? We know that even in the words of Jesus. As Jesus is standing before Pilate in John 18, 37, Pilate looks at him and says, are you the king? Are you a king? They're declaring that you're the king. Are you the king who who has come to die? And Jesus says this, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I was born. I am standing before you right now, and this is why I was born. All of this is not happening because my disciples abandoned me and because things are out of control. No, this was preordained before the foundations of this earth. I stand before you, Pilate, getting ready to die upon a cross. Why? Because this is the cause for which I came. It's my love. As I said it last week, he's the only person who's ever been born who didn't have to die. For the wages of sin is what? He had no sin. So really you could say he's the only person in history who did not have to die. There's no sin. There was no seed of sin. And so really you could basically say in the story of his birth and his death and his resurrection that Jesus really is the only one who truly chose to die. None of us have that choice. It's going to happen regardless. Two signs. He will be the mar- Here will be the marker, the monument, the sign from God. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and then it says this, lying in a manger. Well, what does that mean? I know we kind of have the picture here of a manger, and I kind of, kind of think we've glorified it over the years, but basically what is it? It's a feeding trough, right? It's a place where they would put the, the hay, or it's the place where they would put the straw to feed livestock. Think about this. Remember what Jesus said in John 6, 35? This is what he says about himself. Jesus said to them, I am the what of life? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And so here is Luke writing just this description of his birth. Hey, the angel comes to the shepherd and says, hey, go find this baby, not an ordinary baby, the one and only, the one that all of those sacrifices were pointing to, all of the one that it was illuminating, that it was illustrating. Go find that baby. The shepherd says, how do we know? Which one is the baby sent by God? You'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's a picture. If this baby came to die, you will find him in a manger. A baby in a feeding trough. Think about that for a second. The one who the Bible declares owns a cattle on a thousand hills, born in a place where they keep cattle. He would humble himself, as Paul said. Passing through the heavens, he would come to save. No wonder Paul says this as a challenge to us in the church. In Philippians 2, he says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of men, flesh and bones, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He didn't just humble himself at his birth, right? I mean, what, a, what humility that required, that God would come into his own creation as a helpless baby, requiring adults, human beings, to take care of his needs, God. That's humility. But Paul says, listen, it's not just humility in his birth. It goes beyond that. And he addresses and states the reason he came. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I pray that as we walk through these next couple of days, that it wouldn't just be again Christmas. We would individually just pause and reflect upon what the story of Christmas means to us individually. There will come a day that every one of us will stand before our creator. And to know that we can stand before a holy God covered in the righteousness of Jesus, how could we not be quick to proclaim truly what this celebration is about? Every eyes closed and every head. It's his story. But it's his story that's become our story, right? It's my story. God's story is my story. It's a story about me. It's a story about you. It's a story about our sins. Let's be real. And the Bible tells us that we've all fallen short, every one of us. The Bible says if you're guilty of even just one, if you've broken just one of God's laws, you've broken them all. But we all stand in quite the predicament in our sins. But the story of Christmas points us to hope, right? The story of Christmas points us to the, the hope that was proclaimed there in the garden. In the darkest hour when sin entered into humanity, God proclaimed hope right there. He didn't say when, he just said it was going to come. And in his perfection, in his sovereignty, in his providence, in the fullness of time, Jesus came with you, with me on his heart and mind. I pray you hear that, I pray you know that. With whatever it is you may be walking with this Christmas season, I pray you see a Savior who loves you. Who came specifically for you. To do what we can't do of ourselves. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's a heart that cries out. Lord, I acknowledge my sins, and by faith I profess this Jesus as my Savior who died for me and who rose again. Paul says it's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. There's nothing we can do because we would take pride in that. That's our sinful nature. But humility is recognizing, God, there's nothing I have done to make you love me more. You've displayed that perfect love already. So if you're here today and you've never personally experienced what Christmas is really about, I pray that even right now, God would stir your heart in a way that you would see the personal aspect of the story. A Savior, Christ the Lord, the anointed of God sent to save. To believers in this place, I pray you're encouraged. Maybe you're struggling with God's timing. Maybe you're struggling with the promise of God. Maybe you're struggling just this Christmas season. It is a hard time. I pray you know you have a Savior that walks closer to you than a brother, who will promise to never leave you nor forsake you, and as believers we can say truly we are never alone. Our God goes before us, and greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. The promises that we can proclaim because of Christmas. I'm going to invite you right where you are to stand, if you would, as we go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to pray. We're going to enter into this time. I want to encourage you to do something as we pray. I want you to reflect back to those of you who know the Lord in this place. I want you to reflect back to where you were when the Lord found you. 
when the Lord saved you. Maybe it was in a service like this. Maybe it wasn't. It was at your house or in a car. We go back to that moment right now, and let's just see for a moment as we go to the Lord in prayer, Christmas, through the lens of our salvation. Join with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, But we thank you that we do not serve a God far off. We thank you that we serve a God who pursued us, who came to us, that while we were lost in darkness and in our sins, you sought us. And by your grace and by your mercy, through the blood of Jesus, you've forgiven us. You've given us life. and dwelled us with your presence. And so, Lord, as we walk through these next couple of days, Lord, we see the story of Christmas right in line with our salvation of a God who pursued us. And so, Lord, I pray today, this service, and then the next two, there's one who's never experienced this love, this unfailing, unconditional love, a love that this world cannot offer. I pray, Lord, that you would just cover them, speak to them. To believers in this place, Lord, I pray that they would feel your presence. Your word tells us that your grace is sufficient, and I believe that it is unique. Your workings, your grace is unique to us and the situations that you lead us in. And so, Lord, may your grace fill our hearts and our minds as we walk through this Christmas season. We give you praise for what you have done, a promise fulfilled. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, a Savior, the anointed of God, who came to save. We give him praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said.